Anil, uh, to develop theories of consciousness, uh, really two parts. One is to assemble the theories, and then secondly, determine what are the ways that we can evaluate them and, and compare them. Uh, you have uh, been one of the pioneers in looking at uh, certainly brain-related uh, theories of consciousness and, and uh, uh, building um, a structure around them. And as you look at that, what, what are the ways that you, you go about by evaluating individual theories? One question that's really difficult is how we evaluate the different theories that, that are on offer. And it really depends on the particular theory. Some theories are harder to empirically test th than others. But to be called scientific theories, I think they need to make testable predictions, even if these predictions are not about core central elements mm. of the theory. So let's take you know, two examples. So one example would be the predictive processing kinds of theories. Now, these are interesting because predictive processing is more a, a general theory of how the brain yeah, works, works right, rather right. than being a theory of consciousness first and foremost. Right. So one then has to add something to it to make it a theory of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And then you can test that bit. And this may be that, for instance, conscious content is associated with the optimal inference the brain is making. And that can be tested in various ways. Like, do we see consciously more quickly, more accurately, things that align with our brain's expectations or that, that deviate from them? And we can do experiments in the lab that test those kinds of predictions. You know, another way of testing a theory would be more appropriate for something like global workspace theory, where you would say, OK, if something becomes consciously reportable, some sensory stimulus, then it should trigger this kind of wave of ignition in the frontal regions, the parietal regions, whatever global workspace say is the, is the global workspace. And so that becomes testable at a very neurophysiological level. Um, and these predictions, you know, they, they may be not inconsistent with each other, but they're motivated differently. Uh, on global workspace theory, that is a, a way the brain is organized that causes it, and they have specifically uh, emphasize the frontal lobes, but the, 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 over, the, the fundamental process there is a, uh, a broadcasting or a, a, a broad uh, uh, um, recognition that this is occurring at the same time. So if it didn't occur in the frontal lobes and it was in other places, it still could be a broadcasting system. And so I, I'm, I'm concerned that if you limit it to the frontal lobes as a prediction of that, you can lose the core idea if you don't find it in the frontal lobes. Is it yeah, I mean, it might be. It might, it might, but then if you, if you say any kind of neuronal signaling counts as broadcast, then the theory yeah, is yeah, deflated, the theory so it becomes everything. a little, bit, a little yeah. bit meaningless. But indeed, one question for proponents of global workspace theory is, okay, what, is the, what are the minimal conditions for something to count as a, as a global workspace. Yeah, yeah. And it, you know, one of the interesting debates here is that if you define the global workspace as involving these frontal parietal regions, well, maybe the activity that you see there is more to do with our reporting what we're conscious of rather than the conscious experience itself. Mm -hmm. And that's a very active debate mm -hmm. in the field. But yeah, you're right. You, there needs to be more precision about what these core concepts of things like ignition and broadcast yeah. actually consist in. Yeah. Uh, and, and then you have various different kinds of theories. The neurobiological theories like uh, global workspace seem more amenable to the kinds of testing that we can do today. But that doesn't mean that's the way you know, re reality has created consciousness. I mean, there are electromagnetic field theories. Uh, as an example, representational, higher order representation. These are harder to test than something that's built on neuro, neurobi you know, core neurobiology. That's right. I think one of the limiting factors is the experimental methods that we have. You know, we've got particle accelerators to look at the very small in physics. We've got things like the James Webb telescope <laughs> yeah. to look very far away and very long ago. But we don't have the equivalent for the brain. I mean, we don't have something that's equivalent to the complexity of the brain, that can image, visualize, analyze you know, billions and billions of neurons at once. And this is just the way things are currently, but I think you're right that we need to 
be mindful that the theories that we have shouldn't be overly constrained by the windows we can currently look through. <laughs> uh, what about quantum theories? Because that's a whole different category. Uh, and there's a, a broad number of them operating you know, from subcellular level to much, much larger. Um, do, those, do those theories which seem to be outside the normal orbit of, uh, of uh, classical neurobiological theories, uh, can they be introduced into a, 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 this uh, methodology of uh, thinking about uh, evaluating theories? Yeah, I think maybe. You know, quantum theories tend to be treated a bit derisively in the community, and I've done this myself on occasion over the last 20 years. But ultimately, from a materialist, physicalist perspective, quantum mechanics is our best theory yeah. of the material world. And so it may be relevant to consciousness in, in some way. Now, there's this danger of saying something like consciousness is mysterious and quantum mechanics yeah, yeah. is mysterious, so they <laughs> must be related. But that doesn't mean that consciousness is not somehow related in an explanatory way to a quantum process. I think the jury is very much out there. There are some specific theories that tie quantum mechanics and consciousness together, the so-called orchestrated objective reduction theory. Uh, personally, I don't see a huge amount of evidence for that. But there, there may be relevant points there. So things like anesthesia. The mechanism of action of anesthesia is still a little bit unclear. And it may turn out that it's a quantum biological effect. Now, does that mean we have a quantum theory of consciousness? Not, not really, because quantum biological effects crop up in other places too. Sure. We need it to understand photosynthesis, magnetoreception in birds. So just because quantum mechanics, if it turns out that quantum mechanics is the right level of description to understand something like anesthesia, that does not mean that we have evidence that consciousness is itself fundamentally quantum in nature. That's a very different thing. And I think the jury is very much out on that larger question. Yeah, and I think what this points out is that to think about, about the, the way we go about evaluating theories is an important part of the evaluation process. Normally, you, you just evaluate the theories based on whether something is predictable or not, but to understand how you evaluate and what the process is and how you evaluate different kinds of theories is part of the whole process. A little bit more it's philosophy of science in a sense, but I think it's, it's needed in consciousness studies. It's absolutely needed. So theories, as well as generating testable predictions, they have to give some explanatory insight too. And it's also not enough just to say that a theory is compatible with things that have been discovered mm -hmm. in the past. I mean, that's very easy to say. I think theories have to be productive looking forward and make predictions that you wouldn't have come to uh, from other theoretical perspectives.